Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Happy March. How was your February? Was it good? I hope it was good. I hope March is even better, my delicious little donut. It's Women's History Month, and you know that we love history history, you know, (laughs) we love women's history here. It's in the tagline. And today we are going to start the month of March with some very exciting, deadly ladies. But before we get into that, let's have a little bit of housekeeping, shall we? Over on YouTube, a new series has started called History That Ate. I thought that was a very clever name. I came up with it myself. It has officially, officially launched. By the time this episode comes out, there will already be one History That Ate episode that has been uploaded. (laughs) We will take a look at certain dishes throughout time and space. We'll cook them, we'll talk about the history of them, and we'll see if they're any good. I'm not the best cook in the world, but we're gonna have fun while we do it. And if you're a Patreon member, you can get notified when we go live beforehand and also get an ingredients slash recipe list so that you can cook with me as I'm doing the live. Second order of business is the Epic History BFF trip has launched and we're going to Egypt. If you've been following me over on Instagram, you'll have already seen it, but just in case, if you'd like to join me on our Epic History BFF meetup, you can head to the link in the show notes and sign up for that. There are, as of this recording, there are three early bird special, uh, specials, <laughs> three early bird special offers. It's like $200 off of the regular price of a, the ticket. So if you'd like to snag those up, you can. There are only 20 spots available for this trip. So go ahead and get yourself all booked and ready for the History BFF meetup. And I'm really excited about it. We're going to go to the Valley of the King. We're going to go on a Nile River cruise and we're going to go see our bestie had Shep suit at her temple complex. I don't know why I made that hand motion, but I'm very excited about it. I would absolutely love to see you there. So hurry on over and snag your spot because there are only 20 spots available for this trip. And final piece of business, we've got new merch that is very cute. It was inspired by our lovely lady of the history hotline, Sharon. And they say the only dumb question is the one we don't ask. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see what it looks like right here. We have a couple designs and they're absolutely wonderful. I'm waiting for mine to come in the mail right now. And also we have stickers and magnets and pins now, which has been, people have been wanting them and now I have finally (laughs) done them. So there are stickers and magnets and pins available now with all sorts of designs. So you can check the show notes for that loveliness. So without further ado, let's talk about our little dangerous ladies because it's time to travel back in time and witness murder. Just kidding, we're not gonna witness murder. We're just we're just gonna talk about murder. <laughs> because today we're talking about the one, the only, the poison maidens of ancient India. So grab your best anti-venom, put your hot beverage in a to-go cup, because we're going in the time machine to travel back to ancient India. So let's get to it. If you leave this episode today remembering only one thing, please let it be that ancient India loved poison. I'm talking like the way to assassinate your enemies was poison. Like, oh, you're the next in line and you want to kill all your siblings so that they don't stand in their way? Poison. Are you a woman married to a very old man and you want to take all his money? Poison. If you are a government official and some young whippersnapper is rising in the ranks and you don't want to be usurped, poison. Just poison them. Problem, solution, poison. (laughs) There are so many stories in Indian history and mythology that involved poisoning. Some of the oldest texts in India written in Sanskrit are on the subject of poison. There are countless books, but The one that we're going to be talking today about, today about, the one we're going to be talking about today, English is hard, is the Ashtanga, 
Khidja. There are many other books that I don't know how to pronounce, and I could not find pronunciations of them because they are incredibly old. But if you would like to see the titles of them, I'll leave them in the show notes below. Poison was not only involved in scientific and historical documents, it was also written about in mythology and oral legends. The creation of Poison, in fact, has its own origin story, too, in fact, but we're just going to talk about one today. In the 1896 issue of the Indian Medical Gazette, M. Subramanya Aida translated one of the two stories which I will read to you now. Here it goes. Once upon a time, Devas and Asuras, descendants of two sisters, churned the milk sea with a view to get Maritha, or the sweet nectar of immortal bliss, and as a result of which process several products are said to have been ushered into existence. The first product so evolved was a huge monstrous figure which was considered the embodiment of evil, just as the nectar they were trying to get was the embodiment of good. This figure was looked upon as the incarnation of poison and was by the interposition of Brahma destroyed and dissipated into a number of small particles from which all poisons of the world are said to have sprung. This is an account taken from the Astanga Didavya. Another account of the original story is mentioned in another book, but that's just the one that we're going to talk about today. Isn't it cool to read things from such a long time ago? It feels like time traveling to me, and I get goosebumps just thinking about this person from such a long time ago translating something that was written from even longer ago, and now it is being read by some random American lady living in Japan talking into a metallic honeycomb-looking thing and, and, and telling you about it, my delicious little donut. The world is so freaking cool, but I will digress. The cultivation of poison was a huge part of scientific study and the subject of many books. The main book that we're going to focus on today is the Ashtanga Tidaya, which was written sometime between the 7th and 8th century CE. And it's an incredibly extensive book on poisons, their classifications, and how to make them, how to make the antidotes, and how to spot poisons, as well as testing for their presence. This was like a must-have handbook for anyone practicing Ayurvedic medicine and also anyone who was close to a person of power who was in charge of keeping them safe because like we talked about before, being poisoned was kind of a matter of when and not if. I would love to talk about this entire book, but unfortunately, that would have to be a whole nother episode, which I'm more than happy to do if you are interested in that. But to get us started, let's talk about the basics. So it starts out with the classification of poisons in three categories. The first one being Sitabara, or immobile poisons, Jungama, or mobile poisons, and Garavisham, which is a poison made from components that are harmless by themselves, but when combined become deadly. The immobile poisons come from veggies or roots, basically any plants. They're the vegan, <laughs> vegan option of poisons. If, if you're interested in veganism, can you imagine a person who's like, I really want to poison somebody, but I want to be ethical about it. <laughs> I'm only going to use plant-based poison. Anyways, so silly. And the other ones, Jungama poisons or mobile poisons, come from things that are mobile, things that are moving like snakes and bugs and insects, anything that has the ability to move, basically. Not all poisons in this book are deadly, however. Some terminate pregnancies. Some cause the poison E, the person getting poisoned, to go into a zombified state. And others supposedly could take a disease from someone and give it to some other living thing which included things like trees and plants and stuff. So you, you could take this poison if you were sick and somehow that sickness would transfer to a tree or a bush or a, a dude, which is, which is wild. But there's one poison from this book that I love even more than that one. And it's a poison that you created for yourself that could give you complete mastery 
over the universe. And I want that poison so bad. I want to try it so bad. What what is the limit of this complete mastery of the universe? What could I do? Could I change the laws of physics? I need to know more about this type of poison (laughs) that I want to give myself. But unfortunately, that's all the information that it has in that book. But I will digress. The poisons are seemingly endless. And one group of very astrologically unlucky girls would be subject to all of them. The Vishkanya. The Poison Maidens of India. We can trace their history or myth story, TM, as I like to call it, back to the 3rd century BCE during the Maurya Empire, the first empire of what we now call India. The first emperor, Chandragupta Maurya, had a tough gig. He was the first emperor and therefore a lot of people wanted to take his position. Being the first anything is pretty tough and being the first emperor of an entire nation is like final boss level of a game type of tough. So a lot of people wanted to poison this poor fella. But our emperor was very lucky because he had a bestie. Some call them political advisors, but tomatoes, tomatoes. His bestie, Chanakya, was a crazy smart guy. He was a philosopher, a jurist, a teacher, an economist, and very well versed in poison. Bestie Chanukya wrote his magnum opus, the Atha Shastra, a hella long treatise, which is basically a work dealing formally and systematically with a subject, aka a fancy word for essay. So in his fancy essay, he gave advice on everything. Statecraft, political science, economic policy, military strategy, the nature of government, law, civil and criminal court systems, ethics, economics, market and trade, the methods for screening ministers, diplomacy, theories on war, nature of peace, the duties and obligations of the king, and how to use and avoid poison maidens, the Vishkanya. So let's take a step back and talk about the Vishkanya, who they were and how they became the poison maidens. This is the part of the story, dear one, that kind of sucks. I wish that the Vishkanya were badass lady assassins that chose their life of murder and mystery of their own fruition. But alas, my delicious little donut, they did not. Their life was decided by the stars. According to the Skanda Purana, a Hindu religious text from possibly the 4th or 5th century, a girl who is born when the sun is in the constellation Chitra or when the moon is in the 14th lunar day is fated to become a Vishkanya. Hey, editing TK here, and uh, I was googling images of the Chitra constellation to show you when I came across the fact that the Chitra constellation is the Indian version of Virgo. And guess who is a Virgo? It's me. I'm a Virgo. And I am both delighted and terrified that if I would have been born back in ancient India in the third century, (laughs) I could have been a Vishkanya. And now I feel personally connected to these ladies who were born under this inauspicious constellation? Does that mean my constellation is inauspicious? I'm smiling right now, but I just, I needed to tell you that. (laughs) Because this type of woman is supposed to cause the death of her husband after being married to him for only a period of six months making the house that she lives in become devoid of wealth and cause misery to her family, which is a heavy, heavy burden to place on newborn little babies. This is like the second episode in this season where we just put all of this pressure on infants and (laughs) and decide their lives by really arbitrary, stupid things. But anyways, these poor little babies who had very shitty horoscopes would then be sent to some secret location and given one single drop of poison. If they survived, they would be fed a steadily increasing diet of various poisons so that they would become immune to all forms of poison, which is 
scientifically possible. You can build up an immunity to a lot of poisons, but what is a little more myth and a little less historical is the idea that they themselves become poison. Their breath, their skin, their spit, their downstairs disco zones, and all of the fluids related to that all apparently became poisonous. But that's that's some questionable science. We'll have to get Hank Green on that one. If he could if he could let us know, <laughs> that would be great. But I found nowhere of people actually becoming poisonous. And I would I would love for you to venture a guess as to who the person is who started this whole thing. Can you guess? Can you make a guess? We've talked about him. There's only been a few people we've talked about. It's Bestie Chanukya. I felt so betrayed when I learned that. Bestie Chanukya. How the mighty have fallen. I know we just met, but I felt a very strong connection to you. You you were a nice guy, but welcome to the human garbage pile. Welcome to the human garbage pile. Apparently, Chanukya was the one who created this system. He being a master of astrology, found this whole loophole in the astrological chart and figured these little girls who, you know, wouldn't be married and therefore not serve a purpose in society would better spend their lives as assassins. So that is what he apparently did. Life at this secret Vishkanya location wasn't only about poison, though. The girls were also supposedly taught how to dance, sing, play music. They were educated. They knew how to be witty and charming because their whole shtick was to be sexy, to get your target vulnerable, and to yeet them out of this life into the next. According to legend and myth store text, just one kiss could kill a man. Even breathing the breath of a Vishkanya could kill, but their preferred method of poisoning was a poison drink. They would pour the drink for their companion slash target and drink from the cup to prove that it wasn't poison, then offer it to the poor soul who was about to shed their mortal coil. The poison would have no effect on the Vishkanya, but to the regular regular person who drank it, this would be the last sip they ever took. In the old Sanskrit stories about Vishkanya, they were used in various ways, like being sent into camps of enemies to delight them with dance and then dance on their graves after they murdered them. There's another story of a monk hiring a Vishkanya to kill a king's advisor. There's even a legend about an Indian queen fed up with Alexander the Great's conquest and she sent out countless Dan- what? No. (laughs) She sent out countless poison damsels to try and poison him, but pesky old Aristotle thwarted her plan by warning Alex to keep it in his pants. However, when we travel back to the BCEs, history and legend kind of blur together and the lines become a little bit unclear. The story of Aristotle and Alexander the Great is most likely a myth, a fun little rumor started to warn people of the dangers of Vishkanya. And that is just the beginning of the mythologicalization of Vishkanya. Many outsiders who came into contact with the air quotes exoticness of India found much inspiration and also were a little bit afraid of what they saw. People like Bram Stoker took inspiration from the Vitalia or Indian vampire, which we have an episode on, and Vishkanya was no different. Back in the 1800s, adventure scholars, aka colonizers with a fancier name, were fascinated by the idea of women becoming poisoned solely because of the stars they were born under. And that fascination carried on into the 20th and 21st century. In the West, Vishkanya have been the inspiration for characters like DC's Poison Ivy, who almost kills Batman with a poison kiss. India has also created many a Bollywood movie and TV shows either with Vishkanya or solely based around them. There are even novels like 
Chanakya's Chants by Ashwin Sanghi that go so far as to create lore around what life would have been like in the secret Vishkanya making locations. He has a very elaborate milk based poison poison regimen that the girls do in the book. It's it's very interesting. Like the the different poisons have different colors, and once they reach different ages, like they have different poison concoctions that they drink. It's a really fascinating book. And as interesting as that fictionalization is, there isn't a lot of information about the Vishkanya available to the public that comes from historical texts. And much of the information that is out into the public is fish fictionalized. They lump all the things together, the actual history and the lore that has been created. Some historians don't even believe that they were a real thing. And while there is no hard and fast, this is the truth artifact to confirm or deny the existence of Vishkanya, we can reasonably assume that they were real given the treatise written by Bestie Turngar garbage human, as well as the Ashtanga Tijya book on poison and the writings found in other cultures like Persia and Greece, as well as the plethora of poison books written in Sanskrit. Of course, when we go back three, four thousand years in history, things are going to get mystified and we may never know with 100% certainty if they were real or not. But that's kind of the magic and misfortune of history. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought. I am so excited to tell you this one. I'm a huge fan of Bollywood. One of my four moms, as I like to call the group of ladies that were my mom's best friends when I was growing up, one of them is from Nepal. And when we went over to her house, which was very often, we would sometimes get to watch TV shows or movies from Nepal. Sammy mom also did traditional Nepalese dances and we would watch her perform every year. And these two things were my gateway drug into Bollywood movies and dramas. And when I found out that there is a Vishkanya Bollywood drama, I almost died. I won't spoil it for you, but it is ridiculous. It's it's so funny. But basically, the plot is a young girl doesn't realize that she's a Vishkanya because her mom kept her lock in her lock kept her locked in her room for her whole life, which is very much giving Disney. But one day she is allowed to go out to a party. And of course she falls in love with some dude who is very handsome. And she starts questioning everything like why she hasn't been allowed out of her room her whole life. And also why her skin turns blue when she's upset. And later on, we find out that her mom purposely let her out to this party because she has ulterior motives, okay? Her mom really wanted her to meet that guy in order to get her daughter to kill everybody. Ted has joined us. In order to get her daughter to kill the guy and his entire family. <laughs> And the scenes, the, the cinematography is dramatic. It's ridiculous. It's, it's everything you want in a really good Bollywood drama. And I hope that you can watch it, right, Ted? Well, dear one, thank you so much for joining me today to learn about these poison maidens. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend, airdrop it to a stranger on the highway. You know, I mean, they'd love it. A little chaos never hurt anybody. If you haven't already, please leave a rating slash and review on whatever platform you're listening to. And or you could let me know what you think of this particular episode on Spotify's little new comment thingy. Unfortunately, I can't comment back, but I read every single one and it helps other people find For the Love of History. If you haven't already, please join us over on YouTube. We just had a History That Ate cooking event, a live event over there, and Patreon members get an ingredients list and advance notice of when the live is going to be so that they can prepare and cook along with me. And it's really, really fun. You can also support the podcast. 
pep pep based <laughs> the podcast by getting your cute little hands on some super cute merch. We have new the only dumb question is the one we don't ask merch, which is great. It's so adorable. I'm waiting for mine to come in the mail right now. Uh, you could also get this history shirt that I'll show you. I'll show you the back of it. It's very cute. It's got sunflowers on it, which is my favorite flower. And if you do get some merch, I would love to be tagged in any pictures you post because it just makes me so happy to see you in official History BFF merchandise. And who knows, we might be twinning. We could have the same, the same shirt. And before we go today, a special shout out to the wonderful Patreons who helped me make this podcast better and better each week. Emily, Shayna, April, M, Jennifer, Jamie, Sarah, Emily, Jordan, Laurel, and Lauren. Thank you so, so much. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your support. And with that, I will tell you to take good care of yourself this week, drink your water, do something that brings you joy, and I will see you next week when we talk about cloud warriors what could what could that even possibly be i'm so excited about it okay i'll see you later love you bye ted please hey ma'am get out of here red spaghetti red spaghetti red spaghetti thank you Thanks very much. I love you so much. I love you so much. You need to go. I love you so much. You need to go. Hey. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How did anybody do anything before energy drinks? Actually, Samurai did have energy drinks, which is something we're definitely going to talk about later. Ready? Ready? Spaghetti. A little open up garage pond. A little burp. <laughs> oh, snuggle you see me. I shall look you too. Anyways. Someday we'll talk about samurai drinking energy drinks. That will be so exciting to talk about that topic. <laughs> Am I recording? Hold on. No, I was not recording. <laughs>